Well, it's been a very interesting six months, hasn't it? You look at the world leaders that are there today and you think, oh, how did that happen? Theresa May is our Prime Minister. Well, she's there because the UK has voted to leave the EU and uh, the Prime Minister there at the time, uh, David Cameron, has decided to uh, leave office because the, the UK voted against him. Jeremy Corbyn has voted to stay on as the Labour leader against all of the predictions uh, of the, and all of the, the will of the politicians. And then there's Donald Trump, who has now become the President of the United States. Wow. A loose cannon, I would say, in control of the most powerful nation in the world, with his finger on that button. And he's already upset the Chinese and caused all sorts of uh, uh, controversy. And he hasn't even taken office yet. And then the chap underneath the middle, uh, he's the new Italian Prime Minister. He only came to office a few days ago, on the 12th, because again, the people in Italy had voted against the pre previous Prime Minister's ideas, and he left office. And the next one along, in the spring, will be the German uh, elections. You wonder what will happen there as well. Um, it's really amazing the way things are changing, isn't it? And the way the leaders are changing in the world. Now, the Western nations are generally proud of their fair and democratic way in which their leaders are selected. And conversely, the media is quick to condemn, either rightly or wrongly, those nations that select their leaders in a different manner, which may not be seen as so equitable. So, how do leaders come into power? Well, obviously, there's the ballot box, democracy. That's only really quite a recent idea. You could say, well, here, Nelson Mandela, again, it was a democratic process, but really, everyone wanted him to be leader, and the, 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 the vote that took place was a, a mere formality. He was made a leader by sort of, um, popular acclaim, if you like. And, of course, there were those that become leaders by inheritance, now, there's not so many kings and queens that have absolute power over their nations. Most of them are now figureheads these days. Um, but of course, there are some family dynasties uh, that rule in various countries. The, the Saudis, for example, the North Koreans, a family dynasty, where one, the son inherits the, the power given by the, the father. Then, of course, there are those that take power by force. Also, there are those that are selected by a small minority. The Chinese leaders, for example, selected by a, a, a committee, a political elite. But you could even say that of, of, of Western leaders as well. Uh, the presidential candidates, after all, have been selected by a, a small minority, hence why the dynasties like the Kennedys and the Bushes and the, and, and the Clintons had ongoing influence. And even our MPs in this country are selected by their constituency parties, by a group of local uh, uh, followers of a particular party and put forward as a candidate for election. So in many cases, leaders are, are chosen by a few. And then even some of the religious leaders are selected by just a few. Uh, the Pope by a, a group of, of cardinals, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury by an even smaller group uh, with the, the input from, from the Prime Minister. In history, there are other ways in which leaders have come to power, as well as the obvious kings and queens and the general uh, in inheritance, uh, one uh, father to son, father to daughter in some cases. There are also kings that have come to power through conflict. For example, uh, William I uh, in 1066 came into power in the UK because he led a conquest of the UK from France. And the Crusaders in the, the, the 11th and 12th centuries, they took power in Jerusalem at certain points. And it was normally the head of the armed forces that ended up as the leader of the country. As they 
uh, make conquest of other regions. Then there's dictators that rise to power rather than being elected or, or fighting their way into power. Officials that rise to the ranks. For example, Napoleon engineered a coup and, uh, and became emperor of the French as he rose through the ranks. And sometimes there are those that, um, that, that end up doing deals when there is no royal heir left or when a governor is put in place by a conquering power. So, for example, in, in Bible times, the Herods were in power because they did a deal with the Romans. So, there are many ways in which over history people have come to be leaders, to be world leaders. What about Bible times? Well, we have four leaders there for our examples. Joseph, he became a leader. He was appointed by Pharaoh uh, after he'd interpreted a dream of Pharaoh, well, two dreams as it happens. Mm -hmm. And he was appointed by Pharaoh to be the second in command, a leader over Egypt. Saul, who was the first king of, of Israel, he was selected by Samuel when they, they gathered together and lots were drawn and first his tribe, then the family, then, then the local family, then Saul, then, uh, then Saul was selected by these lots. Mm -hmm. Samuel was brought up by the high priest Eli and thus came into a, a <coughs> position of influence in the nation. And he was the one that anointed David um, when he was still a youth when he met with his father and his brothers and David was brought in from the fields and selected as the one to lead Israel. So many different ways in which um, people are selected to, to, to uh, come into power and of course there was also violence and conquest and, and deals for example Jeroboam um, came into power um, as, as against, the, uh, against Rehoboam and so on. But the question really is, was it man that put all these leaders in place? Was it the selection processes that have been going through throughout the centuries that have brought those individuals into the positions of power that they have then ruled a nation or nations? Well, of course, the creator of our earth the Lord God, he is the owner of his creation. It is his creation, it is his earth. As the psalmist says, the earth is the Lord's and all, his, all its fullness, the world and those that dwell therein. Uh, for the most high is awesome and he is king over the earth. He is king over the earth, it's God's earth. He claims that he is the king over the earth through the psalmists. That they may know that you whose name alone is the Lord are the most high over all the earth. So God is in control. That's what the psalmist is saying. But how does that fit in with all these men and uh, throughout the ages and women as well uh, in modern days uh, being in power? Well, of course, God has a purpose with his earth. That move, I don't know that we've done that yet. Um, and he has a plan with this earth. And it says in, in, in Isaiah, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, it's his. Who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. God formed his creation for a purpose. Anyone, that's a, anyone that creates anything, creates it generally for a purpose, either for pleasure if it's art, or for a practical reason if it's something, some bit of engineering. But a creator creates the creation for a purpose. And God was no different. God has created the whole creation for a purpose. The world is created that it may be inhabited. 
And God has a plan with this earth, that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So it's giving us the impression, the understanding that God is in control of his creation. He's the one who has who's chosen how his creation will be used and how it will be developed. He wouldn't leave it to chance or to man to decide what would be done, would he? I suppose to some extent he's allowing man to pollute and mismanage the world at the moment. He will not stop the actions of, of human nature. But only up to a point. He will not allow man to go too far. No is testament to that. And the destruction of, uh, 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 the, of the nations in Noah's day. Because God is working towards fulfilling his plan with his creation. He's actually in control. Uh, and he ensures that the overall course of events are leading to fulfilling his purpose. And we'll look at a few examples in a moment or two. You might say, well, how does that fit in with, with what we've seen in the last six months? How does the American election get influenced by God? Can God really influence so many millions of people to individually choose to vote in a particular way? We could say yes, because only one person, uh, one action caused a huge effect on millions of people. That announcement about Hillary Clinton's emails and the way in which that impacted on people's decisions to vote for her. So it only required the actions to be influenced of one person to have that ripple effect into that election. You see, God is in control of the things that happen. Um, let's look back at, uh, through the scriptures and we can see that that is the case in the scriptures. We start back in, in Genesis, in Genesis and, and chapter 12, where God selects the person he wants to rule, to, to have an influence. We read in Genesis 12 and verse 1, God has said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your kindred and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the nations, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. Very specific promise, wasn't it, to Abraham? God wasn't leaving anything to chance. Well, Abraham, go... Go to Israel and, and to Canaan and we'll see what happens. And with a bit of luck, you, you might come, become a great nation. No. It's very, very clear. I will show you a land. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, says God. It's emphatic that he is in control. And he goes on uh, in chapter 13 uh, to say, chapter 13, verse 14, Lift up your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, westward, southward and eastward. For all the land which you see, I will give to you and your descendant forever. So God had a plan that that land will be given to Abraham and his descendant forever. God was in control. God was deciding who was going to rule over that part of his creation but he was taking the longer term view because he was talking about a descendant of Abraham and about that rule being forever another example where it's very clear from scripture that indeed God is selecting the leader of a nation Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7 and here Moses has come before a burning bush. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh and 
that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God selected Moses and made it very clear. Well, what about those other leaders of, of Israel? Well, let's go back to the ones we saw. Joseph was appointed by Pharaoh. But why did Pharaoh appoint him? Because God had given him the ability to interpret uh, dreams, and God had given Pharaoh the dream in the first place. So God had influenced Pharaoh to select Joseph to lead the people. Saul, of course, although there was that, um, that um, selecting of lots, which of course God influenced, before that had happened, God had said to Samuel, go out and meet a man that I'll show you, and he will be the, the king, and his name was Saul. He'd already been selected by God. And Samuel became a prophet after hearing uh, God's voice as a child. And he became a leader because God had chosen him uh, to uh, pronounce God's word uh, to the people. And then David was anointed, not by Samuel's choice, but by God. David thought, uh, Samuel thought, the, the, the eldest of David's brothers looked, looked a, a good chapter to have as a king. And the next one, oh, he was pretty good as well. But no, Samuel was told, no, they, those aren't the men. This is the man. This is the one that I, God, select. And so God selected David. And David acknowledged this. In, in the writing of, of the psalm, Psalm 22, where it says, All the ends of the, earth, of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. The king of Israel, accepting that he doesn't have that power other than God had given it to him. That it is God that is ruling over the nations. And David isn't the only ruler that, that came to understand that and, under, uh, and knew that that was the case. We come to that ruler in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. We come to the, uh, the uh, passage that, uh, that Chris read for us at the beginning. And here was a ruler who ruled over the greatest kingdom, in fact, the biggest empire of his day. Uh, the first great sort of world empire. Um, and he was a ruler there, uh, and he was full of himself. He thought he, he was brilliant. He thought he'd, he created the most wonderful city, the most wonderful uh, empire. And God needed to teach him a lesson. And so God sent a, a dream to Nebuchadnezzar, which is the beginning of chapter 4, warning him, as Daniel was to explain to him, that he was going to be brought low. He was going to be taught that lesson about really where his place was in comparison to God. And it, it was some time later that this actually came to pass. At, at the end of 12 months after this, this, um, this dream, we read in verse 29, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon, having been warned at the beginning of it, earlier on, verse 17, that the most high rules in the kingdom of men, and that he was going to be shown that that was the case. Months later, he'd forgotten what Daniel said. And he said, is this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty. And the words are barely out of his mouth when God spoke and a voice fell from heaven. Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. And we know that he was driven out in madness and lived with beasts uh, of the earth and he had to learn that lesson and it 
took some time for him to learn that lesson. Seven times it says, seven years is the interpretation thereof. Before he learned that lesson, until he knew that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Verse 32. And at the end of that period of madness, then, yes indeed, Nebuchadnezzar did understand. And he says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honoured him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He recognised indeed that God was in charge. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, verse 37, praise and extol and honour the King of Heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he is able to abase. Nebuchadnezzar recognised his pride would be misplaced. And that indeed God rules in the kingdom of men. Now he should have known that from before, um, because it wasn't the first time that he had learnt about it. I said that, we've, we've covered that. Um, because Daniel had come to him some years before. And um, Nebuchadnezzar had had a dream. And Daniel had interpreted it for him, hadn't he? And we know it also very, very well. Uh, uh, this, the, the image of this, this uh, the, the dream of this image. And that it was made of different elements. And Nebuchadnezzar was told by Daniel in chapter 2 that Nebuchadnezzar himself was that head of gold. And he was told then that his kingdom would be conquered by another nation. And that then by a third nation. And that by a fourth exceptionally powerful nation. And he should have realised at that time that... God was controlling things. God was putting in place and foretelling to him what he planned. Of course, Daniel then had more information fed to him later on by, by the Lord to, to understand exactly which those second and third nations were going to be. He had that, that, sec, that, that, that dream in, in, vision in Daniel chapter 7 of the four beasts. The first one, a lion with wings, uh, becoming a man, the, the symbol of Babylon. The second, that lopsided animal, the bear. The third, a swift, four-winged and four-headed leopard. And the fourth, terrible beast of iron. And then that second dream, which, ex which fitted so nicely together, the um, the horns of the uh, of the ram, again lopsided, showing how it fitted into the second beast, the lopsided bear, and he was told specifically that's the Medes and the Persians, and the goat, of course, that which had one large horn like Alexander the Great, followed by uh, four, uh, the four. Uh, generals that took over when Alexander died at an early age. And Daniel is specifically told, by God, that's Greece. He's told about that at a time when Greece was still just a small nation keeping itself to itself, keeping well away from everything that was going on in Babylon. And Daniel understood that. Nebuchadnezzar should have understood that God is in control. It wasn't just God predicting what was going to happen. It was God influencing what was going to happen. And so when all of that is put together, it is so clear that it fits in with Nebuchadnezzar's first dream. And Nebuchadnezzar should have understood that God was in control. And perhaps he did for a short while long enough to put Daniel in a position of power. But then he forgot, because like many leaders, he was headstrong, a bit full of himself. 
and ultimately he came to have to learn again that God is in control. It's not just Nebuchadnezzar, we can, we can look at other leaders. Uh, we can see, for example, the Cyrus, the, the, the uh, um, great leader of the Persians, that was indeed to uh, lead the assault on the Babylonians. And we see in Isaiah 44 um, that it is a prophecy uh, um, about a man called Cyrus. Isaiah 44, verse 28, it says, Thus says the Lord, who says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, uh, saying to Jerusalem, he shall, You shall be built, and to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. To his anointing, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue the nations before him and to loose the armor of kings. Now, Isaiah prophesied about this man, Cyrus, 700 BC. And it's 165 years later that Cyrus comes to power. And indeed, what does he uh, proclaim in his first year? Because the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom. He said, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me. And he has commanded me to build a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. What a thing for a, a Gentile king to say. Someone who had known very little of God until... He took over in Babylon, someone who was clearly taught by Daniel. And he understood. He understood that God had put him in power, that God had given him that um, victory over Babylon, and that God now required him to do something and to allow the people to rebuild Jerusalem. And that he was to finance that enterprise. Just as Isaiah had uh, prophesied 165 years prior to that, God had once again put someone in his place to further the purpose of God with his creation. But these men were not necessarily the best people to lead the nations. As, um, as we've, we've read, that God will put the basest of men in, uh, into uh, a position of power if it is part of his will. Now, what would we really like our leaders to be like? Well, I think we would prefer them to be honest and to be decisive, not to keep on prevaricating and, and, and not making a decision and, and putting things off because they're scared that they might lose a few votes and that people might not like them anymore. We would like them to be trustworthy and incorruptible. <laughs> it's far from what we get at the moment, isn't it? We would like them to be compassionate. But compassion seems to be disappearing uh, in the leaders of, of this world. And I suppose over the centuries, and uh, you look at some of the, uh, the, the dictators and the kings and, and the way they treated the people, the, the, the lack of compassion. We'd like them to be selfless, but that isn't anything that we see these days. We would like them to not show prejudice, but to be inclusive of, of all people, and not to just uh, treat an elite as something special. They would, we would like them to work together to bring harmony and to fulfill all their promises. And we already know that, uh, that, that in America, the promises that were made during the, uh, during the, the elections are, are now being unraveled and, 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 uh, and turned around, just as it was in the UK Brexit votes. The things that were promised are now saying, oh, I didn't quite mean that. The leaders we have at the moment don't, don't fit into that category, do they? This is what we get at the moment, so lying and manipulative leaders. People that are indecisive, people that can be bribed and, uh, and lobbied to make poor decisions. Many of them are violent and oppressing. 
pretty much all of them, I would say, are self-seeking. Uh, and, and perhaps a certain amount of ego that isn't there. Um, most of them show favoritism. And they certainly aren't united. And they fail to keep any of their problems. And because of their, their promises, and because of that, they fail to solve the world's issues. And those are the men that God, at the moment, has allowed to rule over his kingdom. But that most clearly um, isn't uh, God's long-term plan. It isn't what he, he wants for this world. God wants something much better. God has promised us something much better. God has promised us a king, a ruler, that will be perfectly in, a, in accord with the things on the, on the left-hand side and will depose the rulers that we have at the moment, those that rule over God's kingdom right now. And of course, that world leader was chosen 2,000 years ago. And the angel said to Mary, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's so beautiful. And that will be fulfilling that promise to Abraham, and all nations shall be blessed, God told Abraham, because of this. And I'm sure we'll he hear those words on the radio at some point in the next week or so. Or on the telly and the people that will hear in the main will not even understand they won't realize that what it's saying there is that the Lord will reign over the earth forever but that's what we the prospect we have look, to look forward to isn't it that the Lord will return to set up that kingdom to wipe away all the, the, the things of, of, of this world. And that is what God is, is focusing the world towards at the moment. That is why the leaders that are uh, here at the moment are in place, that the world will tip itself to that point where God will say enough and send back his son. And that same Jesus who was taken up into heaven shall so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. He will come back in power and great glory. And then we'll have a truly worthy leader of the earth. The perfect world leader. Psalm 72 says, Yes, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. For he will deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also, and him who has no helper. And there will be an abundance of grain in the earth and on the top of mountains. And his name shall endure forever. His name shall continue as long as the sun. And men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. And that is what God has promised for us. And that is what we have to look forward to. Indeed, God does choose uh, the rulers in the kingdoms of men but he will wipe them away one day very soon to establish his son as the one ruler over the whole earth may that be seen BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth 
and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website, but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel, but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section, where any ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service, where we produce two or three exhortations per week, which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds, so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings, and then later on in the day we publish Thought for the Days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post, there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's Milestone Snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's Weekly World Watch, and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on world news events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.